Good evening. Tonight's topic is Israel is you. It seems as the land of Israel and our brothers and sisters are going through a tremendous turmoil that we feel a little helpless. How can we help Israel? What can we do exactly that's going to permit us to actually conquer the enemy, eradicate and uproot the evil that is attacking Israel in such a horrible fashion? If we're not there to fight, what can we do? So, to understand this and to answer this question, we have to first of all understand who we are, what we represent, and what makes us the nation that Hashem chose to actually bring His godliness in the world. How are we made? What, what makes a person? What makes a Jew? We know that the way God created man is completely different than the way He created all the rest of the creation. When God created the rest of the creation, He spoke and there was. Meaning that in one word, all the vegetation was. In one word, all of the birds were. All the animals were. All the fish were. The water, etc., etc. Now we know that everything needs to have a soul and a body in order to exist. The soul doesn't need to be high at a higher level, but there needs to be some type of spiritual force that maintains the power the existence of the object that gives it its vitality. So when God creates the, the world, He creates everything, everything with its vitality is created at once. When we speak about the creation of man, it's a little different. The way God creates man is afar mina adama. He creates man from dust and He makes literally a human of mud, a big piece of mud, a nice one, and afterwards <coughs> God blows into the nostrils of man a spirit of life. Everything else in creation is one step. Body and soul come as one. The creation of man comes at a two-step process. Why? Why a two-step process? What's so powerful about a two-step process that there isn't in a one-step process? In a one-step process, both the body and the soul have to be at the same level. They have to be, so to say, equal. The power of the soul cannot be much bigger than the power of the body. The, the recipient and the light that shines in it, to give it its vitality, everything is in perfect balance. It came at one. Man, on the other hand, is different. When mineral life, vegetable life, and animal life were created, they were created with a purpose already. Man, concerning man, it says, Aho vakedem tsartani. King David says that he is the last of creation and the first of creation. What does that mean? It means, literally speaking, that after God created everything on Friday, the last creation is man. So what does that mean? Is he the last or is he the first? On one hand, he's the purpose of creation. On the other hand, we see that he is the last of creation. So we say to man, man, really, you have no purpose. The way you were created was purposeless. <coughs> everything else was created with a purpose. As soon as a creation came about, it came with its purpose. 
the original state of man as a piece of mud, a golem, is nothing. He has no purpose. So he's lower than all creations. It's only in the second step when it says God blew into his nostrils a breath of life that suddenly the purpose of man is blown into him. Then he has purpose. But if we look at our bodies, we have to understand that really the body by itself, without the purpose, is lower than all the creations of the world. Everything was created with a purpose. On the other hand, why? Why? The purpose of man is a much higher purpose than everything else. The reason for this is that when you create everything in one step, there's a balance between the body and the soul. When you create it in two steps, the body is the lowest of all creations, but it's inspired and given life and power with the highest level of creation, God's breath. When you speak, how much comes out of your mouth? When you breathe, man de nafach, the Zohar says, mitoch ya nafach, mitoch yuto mi pnim yuto, she itoch yutu pnim yut, hayut ha'adam. The essence of the person is expressed in a breath, in a blow. God <coughs> blows into his nostrils a breath of life. So on one hand you have the essence of God, which is blown into the most physical, purposeless piece of dirt, piece of, 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 uh, of mud, I'm sorry, not dirt. And you have this creation. So what do you have? You have dichotomy here. You have a problem. You have a major problem. You have the most unbalanced being in creation. Someone which on one hand is the lowest and is connected to the highest. Where do I go here from here? If you're an animal, you're an animal. If you're a vegetable, you're a vegetable. No problem. That's my purpose. That's who I am. But the moment that I have on one hand that tremendous force, that tremendous power from the highest possible level in the most physical body pulling me down, what exactly, where do I go now? I feel the two powers constantly fighting over my consciousness, over the nefesh amaskelet, the, the uh, intellectual soul, the processing, the center of my being on who's going to actually dominate here. And each one is very, very powerful. So what do I do? Where do I go? Maimonides says in the laws of Yesodea Torah, of the foundations of the Torah, chapter 3, law number 9, he said over there that everything is, in the preliminary, just before that he explains that everything is composed in the world. There are four main elements, the element of earth, air, fire, and water. Everything you see in the world is composed. For example, he says, if you look at the sun, it's fire and earth. If you look at the angels, it's fire and air. If you look at man, it's earth, air, fire, and water. I won't say earth, wind, and fire, no. Earth, air, fire, and water. <clears throat> Four elements. He says, and therefore, the lighter an element, the more, the closer it is to God. The closer, the more knowledge it has of God. And he says that therefore, the conclusion is, in that law, Maimonides says, the angels, which are just made of fire and air, since the physical element is lighter, therefore the spiritual element is more dominant, and therefore the knowledge angels have of God is a greater knowledge than the knowledge of all the constellations and the sun and the moon, etc. But the sun and the moon, which the, the sun, I'm sorry, which is made of fire and earth, 
has a higher knowledge of God than the human has because the human is made of all four elements so therefore the element of godliness in inside is not as revealed I remember the first time I studied this law in the Maimonides it really bothered me it, 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 it irritated me how is it possible what do you mean you mean to say that the son has more knowledge than me of God than the angels I can understand but the sun and the moon This is all talking about the physical body. The soul is the core essence of everything. It's higher than anything else. And therefore the knowledge the soul has is great. The Talmud of Chagiga, in page 16, says, There there are six things that characterize a human. Three resemble the angel and three resemble the animal. Three resemble the animal. We eat and drink like animals do. We reproduce like animals do. And we, we make our needs like animals do. Like angels, we're able to speak Hebrew like angels do. We stand upright like angels do. And we are able to have knowledge of God like angels do. Which makes you, which makes the Jew basically the one which is able to unite heaven and earth, godliness and physicality in one body. But this is a very stressful situation. Somehow, you need not to become bipolar between spiritual and physical. What am I? I want to be godly, I want to abandon everything in this world. I want to have what's called kaluta nefesh, I'm ready to leave this world and just say, you know what, I don't want any of it. On the other hand, my body tells me I want everything of it. We know the analogy that when a person is born, when a baby is born, that the fists are so tight that you can't open them. And when a person dies, the hands are extended and you can't close them. Because however much you think you're going to take from this world with you, at the end of your life you cannot take anything but the spiritual. But to come to that conclusion and that realization in a conscious way, in a physical way, is a very great struggle. It's the struggle of every single one of us. And that's why, because of that closeness and because of that essential uh, connection to God through our souls, which is a true part of the divine, we have to realize that the struggle is a great struggle. The Hanag in the Biure Tanya says at the end an analogy to this. Imagine a man which is in trouble and decides to avoid the problem. And the way to avoid the problem is to go out into the forest and to just take a walk. He goes out in the forest and he has problems with his family, he has problems with bills, he has all the problems and problems you can imagine with children, etc. And as he's walking in the forest, suddenly he hears a beautiful music. And suddenly he feels so appeased. He feels calm and he feels this his problems are just leaving him. He has no problem. Nothing is a problem anymore. He feels great. <sighs> Next thing you know, night falls. He wakes up and he needs to leave the forest. And as he leaves the forest and he gets closer to his house, he is looking for that music because he lost the music and the problems came back. The reality installed itself, instilled itself again. Everywhere he goes, he's looking for the music. And one finally finds himself in a mall in some type of uh, music <clears throat> store. He listens to a music that, that he really doesn't, he doesn't like. Hard rock music, or today you have worse than that, in the street, you just open your window. And in the middle of this music, which is horrendous to him, which you would never have thought 
never thought for a second to buy a CD of that type of music or noise or however you want to call it, he hears like 15 seconds that remind him a few notes of what he heard in the forest. And now he buys the CD, puts it in his, in his car, and he listens to that 15 seconds. Rewind, 15 seconds, rewind. Then he gets sick and tired of doing that. He listens to the whole song, and when it comes to the high of that 15 seconds, ah, he feels appeased. And suddenly, he listens to the whole record. And suddenly, he forgets why he bought the record in the first place. And he thinks that his reality of what he likes is that music. When really, the only thing that essentially he was connected to was that 15 second, which was a remittance, reminded him of what happened in the forest and that good, peaceful feeling he had. This is the story of the Jew. Before the neshama, before the soul descends in the body, it is so powerfully connected to God. It feels glory at its highest level. It feels wealth at its highest level. It feels high at the highest possible level, the most connection, peace, everything. And then suddenly it's sent on a mission. On a mission to transform itself and in turn to transform the world. But it's put in a body. That body could have landed in South Beach, in Miami Beach, in San Diego in Taiwan, Uzbekistan, or wherever. Each one of these places has its particularity when it comes to being crazy. You go to Rio de Janeiro, you'll find a certain craziness at a certain time of the year. You go to France, it's okay. It's crazy the whole year. That's you now. And the body is suffering. It's suffering because it feels it has this voice inside of itself trying to push for something that the body just can't offer because it's so imprisoned and so caught up in itself, in its reality, which is called the body. The soul, on the other hand, is just wants to scream. I want to get out of here. Why would you put me here? And we have these two voices pushing, each one in its direction. And we don't know what to do. The soul reminds itself of the good music, of that connection, that wealth, that peace, that intensity. And it looks for it. So suddenly you will find that behind every possible movement, good or that you bad, there's a Jew. There's a seeking Jew that's looking for that 15 seconds of good music and just end it up with the Moonies or end it up working with some drug dealer or end it up working in this or that or end it up looking for wealth and making it big or end it up looking for peace. Each one wants to experience what it experienced before as a soul in the body. But we get caught up in the record of life and all its filth and complications and challenges and we forget what exactly we're looking I want to tell you a story. I was just in Israel last week and as the first missiles were falling on Israel, I was at a wedding not far from the airport for a few hours before my flight and a young man, a Hasid of the Rebbe, told me a story. 
told me a story that touched me very much. He said that one day, a great speaker, a Chabad speaker, was speaking. I don't know if I shared the story with you last week. And after hearing the speech, he said, I want to tell you that everything you spoke is nonsense. And he said, what do you mean? Everybody was tapping on the rabbi's back, telling him how they were inspired. And here, this guy just comes out of the blue and says, you're speaking, you spoke nonsense. What do you, what do you mean? He says, very simple. Let me tell you who I am. I went to every possible guru you can imagine on planet Earth, the biggest ones. I worked with them. I watched them. I lived with them. I studied with them. And the way I could identify the connection one has with spirituality, with godliness, was through looking at their eyes. Then, being I'm Jewish, after seeking all these different religions and different gurus, somebody told me you should go see the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So I went to see the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I went there for two weeks. I didn't pray once. But for two weeks, the only thing I would do when he would come out to prayer in the morning and the afternoon at night, I would just stand there and look at him, and stare at him. <clears throat> Till one day, he turned around and just looked at me in the eyes. And in these eyes, I understood something extraordinary. That the physical envelope of the Rebbe has nothing to do in this world. It's only just a little garment. It's a garment that's there to hold a flow of godliness. The only thing that was flowing through it was godliness. And therefore the body was completely secondary, completely detached, and was just something that's needed in order to be attached and to live in this reality of the world. When I hear you, I hear your ego, he said. When I saw the Rebbe, I didn't see any ego. I just saw a flow of godliness just flowing through, and he wasn't in the way. That's what I saw in his eyes. We have that conflict that we look for the ego. We look for the what the body wants. But the ultimate is to just let the light of Hashem flow through us and do what we have to do. But we are the body. For a tzaddik, for a righteous, holy Jew, the body is secondary. Hillel used to say, the great Rabbi Hillel used to say, when he would go eat, I'm going to feed my shameful one. When you feed somebody else, you don't feel what they feel. You're not caught up in the experience of what they're eating. That's how a tzaddik feels. He feels in such control, such mastery of his body, that when he eats, the simple act of eating, he doesn't feel he's feeding himself. He's feeding the body. There is a detachment between the true identity of the person and the envelope that surrounds the person and expresses the person. So, the great challenge is how to make that reality, which is the reality of the soul, the reality of your body. So there's always this challenge. There's these logical things we make inside our mind on how Everything is all right. I could have a little of God, a little of my body, everything, my personal pleasure, God's pleasure, and I'm gonna make a little salad and everybody will be fine. We make everything logical. I'm going to go for the noble priest of uh, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. And at the same time, 
I'm going to make peace with the most horrendous killers, terrorists, because I'm going to call them militants. Everything's going to be just fine. We are called Israel. The Jewish people have two names. When we're referred to, we are called Bnei Yaakov, the children of Jacob. And we are called at the same time Bnei Israel, the children of Israel. What is the difference? Actually, the difference is, and we see that Avraham too had two names. Avraham, and then he became Avraham. Avraham was his name as a as a son of an idol worshiper. Avraham was after he refined himself and received his soul, circumcised himself, came into the covenant. That's why we never use that name Avraham ever again, and you're not allowed to. Because he already came, he became that new reality called Avraham, which has a numerical value of 248 because he was able to take control over his 248 limbs which is the essential difference that exists between somebody righteous and the opposite of being righteous. The Talmud teaches us, Sadikim libam birshutam, reshaim birshut libam. The Tzadik, the righteous, his heart is mastered. He is a master over his heart. But the wicked, the heart is the master. What is the reality which is the dominant reality in your life? So what happens with Yaakov and Israel is that Abraham, we said, mastered his body. Yaakov represents the word Yud, which is the first letter of God's name, and the word Ekev, which is the heel. It represents the foot. The Israel, on the other hand, spells out the word Li Rosh, a head for me. Li Rosh. So you have the state of the Jew, the way he is called, a head, and you have the state of the Jew, the way he is called, a foot. Now, both the foot and the head are important, are essential. Come in. Both the foot and the head are essential. If you want to bring the head in, if you don't have a foot to lead you, you cannot come in. So the foot is represents the action, right? Without the foot, you cannot act. You cannot go forward. But the purpose is not the foot. The purpose is the head. The ultimate, I'm sorry, connection is the head because if the head is not there to direct where the foot needs to go, then we have a problem. The ultimate is li rosh. Li rosh means there's two states. There's the state of the Jewish people as a simple servant that's subservient to God and does even though he does not understand and then there this is the level of Yaakov and then we have the level of Israel the way the Jew has a mind an openness of the mind he has what's called Gadlut Hamochin Gadlut Hamochin is is one of the greatest states we all want to ascend to every tzaddik wants to ascend to it means I have a largeness, I, my, my, my mind is so large, it's able to absorb godliness and translate it in a way that it becomes the master of my consciousness and my reality. It's a higher level of just doing without understanding. There's a ta'anug, there's a pleasure, there's a delight in doing such a thing. Now, we have a problem. Esav, which is bloodthirsty, the enemy 
the brother of Yaakov, wants to fight against him. He goes to fight against him. And he fights the whole night, the Torah tells us. And at this moment, it says, He takes his sword and he's able to touch the thigh, the sciatic nerve of Yaakov. But he's not able to win. Yaakov at this moment tells him, what is your name? He says, he was the angel of Esau. He tells him, now I have to go because I have to pray. Ki Allah shachal, the morning has come. I was fighting till the morning. Once the morning has come, I have to go pray to God. Meanwhile, he fought with him and he gave him a blessing. He says, now that you are able to fight against the angel, against me, your name will no longer be Yaakov, it's going to be Israel. What happened over there? The simple question the Ben Ishchai asks is practically speaking, when you are fighting, if somebody comes to hit you in the thigh, anybody knows in martial arts, you just block, right? You block with your hand down and you're not touched. Why did Yaakov not block? The Rebbe asks a question, we see that earlier on, when Yaakov puts his head down to sleep, to rest after 14 years of studying day and night in the yeshiva, to st after studying Torah, he puts stones around his head in order to protect his head from ferocious animals. Why is he putting stones around his head? Do ferocious animals attack the head or do they attack the stomach? or the other limbs of the body. Besides that, we find that when we went out of Egypt and when we crossed the sea, it says over there, Uvne Israel yotzeim beyad rama, and the Jewish people came out with an upper hand. The answer to all these questions is the following. The Ben Ishchai says that if you look at the hands, the hands are the extension of the heart, they represent the emotions. Hasidut explains that the hands naturally go down because they're attracted to physicality. They represent what the emotions are connected to. When we wash the morning the hands, we do al netilat yadayim, we lift up our hands, we change the direction. When Yaakov Avinu was fighting against his enemy, he was fighting like this. He brought that his emotions should be dominated by his mind. He didn't let the emotions of the heart dominate him. And it was really a fight of the mind. If I am in the right state of mind, then my enemy has no power against me. And that's how Esav was able to touch him at the thigh. But that's it. No more than that. He lost. And then Israel, Yaakov now becomes Israel because he was able to bring mind over matter. When Yaakov puts his head down, he understands that the animal will only attack him if he appears to be an animal himself. That's what our sages teach us. An animal only attacks a person that looks like an animal, that doesn't have the tzedem elokim, doesn't have the image of God upon him. And therefore he understood that if my mind is protected, if my head is in the right place, then my body will not be attacked. My body is only an envelope. And that's why when the Jewish people will go out of Egypt, and there will be such a revelation of God that even the babies, the sucklings, will be able to point and say, this is my God. Which means there will be that gadlut hamochin, there will be this opening of the mind to see godliness and to feel godliness and to understand godliness and to absorb godliness and to live godliness. The Jewish people went out like this according to the Ben Yishai, Because the mind was completely dominating the emotion. Isn't that the problem we all have? The emotion swinging us in one direction and the other up and down, 
yes, no, right, left. We are called Israel. Every single one of us is Israel. But we have a challenge. We have what's called the Nefesh Abahami. We have an animal soul. The Talmud of Kiddushin, page 30, folio B, says concerning the Yetzer Hara, concerning the evil inclination of a person. Yitzro shel adam mitgaber alem, mitchadesh alav v'chol yom, mitgaber alav v'chol yom, umvakesh hamito. The evil incarnation of a person every day strengthens itself and wants to the death of the person, at least the spiritual death. Shenema, as King David says, Sofer Rasha Tzadik Umvakesh Hamito, the Rasha, the wicked, looks at the Tzadik, at the righteous, and he wants his death. Sinat Chinam, purposeless, purposeless. Hatred. No purpose, I just want to hate you. I cannot stand your success. I want your death. What's interesting is that we have these two powers inside of us. We have a Yetzir Tov, we have a positive inclination that wants to connect to the soul. And the Alter Rebbe says exactly, that's exactly our, our body is a city, it's like a country. And you have the two voices that each one wants to dominate the whole city. Who is going to be the master over the city? Who is going to control? So then we have on one hand Israel. Israel, we're going to control. The body is going to be under the dominion of godliness. We're going to do everything for the right reason we realize that the physical body is just an envelope. We need to feed it properly, we need to nourish it, we need to connect it upwards. On the other hand, you have the other side that wants to just kill. It wants to destroy. Why? You already did it for a week. Calm down. Why are you so excited about Judaism? Why are you excited about godliness? Look at all the pleasures of the world. And it's pulling you down, it's pulling you and pulling you and trying to get you in bad habits. You want to be spiritual, go on drugs. You want to be spiritual, spiritual go and, and do some, some other stuff. What do you need to connect to Judaism? You have these two voices. You have the voice of the mind, Li Rosh Israel, the head. And you have the voice of the heart, the left side of the heart, which is the evil inclination. There is one of the most difficult challenges we have is not to have great ideas, to be, to have a great mind. The problem is, how do you bring the great mind that it should be able to go through the throat and actually pump into the heart? The Zohar says, Liba palga lechol shayfi. The heart gives its energy and spreads through the whole body. If you're able to get a little ounce of what's in the mind into the heart, the energy, the power you have, you are a powerhouse. Shlomo Amelech, King Solomon says, A man that is going to plow and sow its field, his field will not get very far. But if he gets an ox <coughs> to plow his field, he'll be able to do a thousandfold. The man is the soul, the body is the ox. If you're able to get your heart with its power in the right direction, wow, you can do things and you can jumpstart the soul and bring the light of the soul to such a level, if you're able to bring the mind and the heart together, wow, nothing can stop you. You're able to do things which are incredible. Like the Hayom Yom says, that if it's not for excitement, if it's not for passion, nothing would ever get done in the world. People sit back and wait for things to get done. 
It's because a little of the mind is able to go into the heart and the heart pumps that energy, that passion that it's, we're able to get. But we have a problem. We have a problem called the throat and the neck. The air pipe and the food pipe. In Hasidut, we explain that the throat is called Meitzar Hagaron, the straits of the throat. The tightness of the truth. Meitzar is the word for Mitzrayim, Egypt. And you have the air pipe and the food pipe, the butler and the baker. You have the neck, which is called Oref in Hebrew, the stubbornness. Oref is the same letters as Pharaoh. So the Egypt of a person is in the throat. In order for the mind, which is Israel, to go down and to dominate the heart, it needs to break through Egypt. Egypt is, I want to think small. I can't do it. I need to consider what others will say. I need to try again. I'm never going to succeed. It's that littleness of the mind that's so caught up in oneself that he can't ever think that he's going to be able to make his dreams happen. In Kabbalah, we have two elements which are called the Satan. The first one is the snake. <clears throat> The original representation of the Satan is the snake. The Satan itself in Kabbalah is called the Samech Mem. Samech Mem. The letter Samech and the letter Mem. You can't say the whole name, that's the way it's referred to. We know that the serpent, the snake, its venom comes from between its teeth. If you look at the word Nachash in Hebrew, Nachash is, the first letter is Nun, the last letter is Shin. Nun and Shin together, you have the word Shen, which means the tooth. What's between the tooth? The letter Chet. The Satan, with its venom, which is Chet, when it attaches itself to the Samech Mem, you have the word Hamas. That is the hatred, the little terrorist that's ready to blow himself up and say, you know what, forget it. I'm ready to kill myself for the pleasures of this, for no reason. I'm going to just, I want his death, the Yetzirah. It's the opposite of what the Jewish people are. No nation in the world is flying over his enemy and sees there's two kids walking by a building, I'm not going to bomb. Ah, all the weapons and the artillery, etc. of the enemy are blowing all over the place. But no, I can't. That's Israel, a mind of its own. It's the only nation. And that's why we're the only one criticized when we, there are lives which are lost in the process. Ah, just today, in Afghanistan, the Americans killed 82 people. Nobody spoke about that. Everything is fine. So what happens is in our life, there comes a time where we have an opening of the mind and we say, you know what, enough is enough. I need to connect myself to my God. This is my true essence. This is the 15 seconds. That's the true reality. Everything else is fake. I'm not going to go for that, these bad habits anymore. I'm not going to poison my life with this, this, these desires and these habits which are destructive. And we're ready to fight. And we fight. And we fight one day, two days, three days, four days, five, six, seven. A whole week we fight. And one day, some uncle, cousin, nephew says a comment about you changing and mocks you and says, come on. 
You're going to become spiritual. You're going to become religious. You're going to connect yourself to God now. Come on. Go back to your bad habits. What is the problem of that? Basically, you've taken the great mind and you brought it back to Egypt, the throat. That's exactly what happened to the people. The Jewish people are fighting the enemy for seven days. And then Egypt says, make peace with Hamas. Because it can only be in that place of the smallness of the mind that we could be, excuse me, stupid enough to even discuss with the most disgusting, brutal, cruel animals of the earth. Only in a state where you're not normal, you are sick in the mind. You descend to Egypt, over there, there's a possibility to discuss Israel with Hamas. So how do we help Israel today not to make the same mistake and not to finish the job and destroy this enemy, which is the enemy of life, which is the enemy of all the countries of the world and all the nations of the world? by conquering our own land. When we will not make peace with our own little Hamas, our own little Yetzirah which is inside of us, and conquer it step by step, five minutes at a time, say, you know what, I'm not going to do this. I need to make that God is the voice that, that's heard here. No other voice. I'm going to finish the job. Because if I don't finish the job today, 2012, in 2014, I will find myself in a worse situation ever. And then, chas v'shalom, I don't even want to go further. If, on the other hand, I'm able to conquer myself, I come to peace with myself, not with the enemy. Then the Zohar says something extraordinary. And I will conclude with this. In this time where we dominate, the soul dominates the body. We will come to the level of Shabbat. What happens on Shabbat? We have an extra soul that's given to us. I will pour over, God says, my spirit over every flesh. And finally we'll be able to rest from our, all our enemies that despise us. We'll be able to rest and be at peace from all these enemies that hate us, a senseless hate. Just like Shabbat is a peaceful day. <coughs> that man on Shabbat is an extra soul. And you have peace and quiet. And if this is the case of the soul, which is feminine, right? How much more so the, the, the part of the soul which is masculine, which is the source of affluence, it has complete peace. And in the Zohar of Parashat Truma, it says over there, when we have that unity, when we're at peace with ourselves, and when we're at peace together, then at that moment, that unity and that, that connection we have is so powerful that the light that shines from us is so powerful that it lets no enemy touch us. I believe, and this is a personal talk, that the 18 days we spent being in unity as a nation for the three teenagers was a preparation to protect us the way we are being protected now in the land of Israel. With the great miracles, incredible miracles that we are seeing. And we're not talking enough about it. 
we need to talk more about these miracles. A rocket that falls all the way to the door, bangs the door, nothing happens to the people inside. A rocket that takes the whole house and the two elderly people which are sitting on the couch are still sitting on the couch with no house around them, but they're alive and nothing happened to them. A rocket that falls by the, 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 the a balcony and it's resting like this, never exploded. A rocket that's sent by the enemy on a electrical plant in Israel and it happens to be the electrical plant that gives electricity to the enemy. And now they just de deprive themselves of electricity, 70,000 people. A rocket that falls on Egypt, one rocket out of the thousand that fell in Israel, falls on Egypt, kills 22 people. That could be the casualties of each one of these rockets. God is showing us his hand in the greatest way. This is not a time to be in Egypt or to be with Hamas. It's a time that we need to bring our mind and open up our mind. God is just putting his hand out for us. Let's go in that direction, each one of us. Let's be a source of affluence. Let, let us be the channel through which godliness is going to speak to our surroundings. Each one of us has the power to touch our surroundings in a very, very special way. If we don't take this opportunity, God forbid, I don't want to even think about it. But if we do take this opportunity, Mashiach will come and we'll have what to speak for ourselves. For Bezat Hashem, let's remind ourselves that each one of us is the land of Israel. Thank you very much.